Hey. Hannah, I'm not going. Not now. Not ever. Why didn't you say this to me when I was alive? My husband and I, we never got a note. Hey, it's Hannah. Hannah Baker. Holy shit. Settle in, because I'm about to tell you the story of my life. More specifically, why my life ended. And if you're listening to this tape, you're one of the reasons why. This is a wild game of survival. Is Hannah telling the truth? Don't believe everything you hear. Whatever Hannah thought she saw, she lied about it on those tapes because she's a crazy drama queen who just killed herself for attention. Hannah has secrets, Mrs. Baker. Hannah's secrets are what killed her. Maybe I'll never know why you did what you did. But I can make you understand how it felt. You don't know the whole story. What else do I need to know? You're just like the rest of them, but I'm not. Everyone is just so nice until they drive you to kill yourself. And sooner or later, the truth will come out. This is a wild game of survival. Uh, hello, Kate. Welcome. We're so happy to have you. Happy to be here. Especially on this, uh, you know, a busy, a busy life you have going yeah. on. You're in a play, um, If I Forget. That's why I got to drink the coffee straight away before I can even say anything, anything. Yeah. Successful <laughs> Netflix show. You got movies coming out. I mean, this is great. What a great time. Yeah, it's been a great year. I'm really excited. So how's the play going? Let's start there. You're in New York. Yeah, I've been here since, uh, yes, I've been here since January. I am doing a play at Roundabout Theater called If I Forget. Um, it's been amazing. Steven Levinson, who wrote the, the book to Dear Evan Hansen, wrote it, and it's been incredible. Um, and yeah, Dan Sullivan directed it. I've got a great cast. Um, Jeremy Shamos, Maria Dizia, Tasha Lawrence, Gary Wilms, Larry Brigman. Yeah, I'm just going to list them all. <laughs> Seth plays my son. Yeah. Is that kind of important for you to, you know, do shows like 13 Reasons Why, but then get back to the stage and, and do live Yeah, I've been wanting to do theater, get back to do theater here uh, for a long time, but my schedule's been crazy. So uh, I was supposed to do a play last summer at Williamstown. I had to pull out to do 13 Reasons Why, um, but I thought it was a great project and um, I wanted to be a part of it. So uh, as soon as we wrapped that, I was like, okay, I got to go do a play in New York immediately. And uh, my agent found me this great play. It was a great role, so it's been really fun. I know I saw a picture going around, too, where uh, your Grey's Anatomy co-star, T.R. Knight, was there. Oh, and yeah, he yeah, shared a... yeah. He, he comes out to support. We support each other, try to see each other whenever we're doing live stuff. Yeah, it was great. Um, so let's talk about this super powerful project. I hope everybody has seen it. If you haven't, I've binge-watched it in about two days because it's one of those shows where you have to keep going. You need yeah, to discover. Yeah, it's definitely bingeable, yeah. Um, how did you get involved? How did you, um, you know, take on the role of Olivia Baker, which is a, a very deep, yeah. deep role for anyone um, who doesn't know? The yeah, have you guys watched it? Have, how many of you have seen it? Yeah, all right, good, good. Some of you, yes, some no. It's, um, it, I think it's a great show. I'm super proud of it. But uh, my agents brought me the script, and um, I, I read it. It was a real, it was a, as I said, it was a page turner, but it was actually a swiper because I was reading it on my iPhone. So I just was like, it was a total swiper. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I was really... It was just incredible, and I could see like the the movie in my head as I was reading. It's always a good sign when you can just see it, the images playing out. And I thought it was so well written. And Brian Yorkey, who won the Pulitzer Prize for Next to Normal, um, is an incredible writer. And Tom McCarthy, I I've known for a long time. He won the as you know the Oscar for Spotlight, and so he was executive producing and directing the first two. And so we got on the phone, and um, it was such a heavy, obviously and for me particularly, a very heavy role to play. And so my, my biggest question, and I had a lot of questions, but one of them was just how involved uh, she would be. Is it going to be a story that's more insulated in high school and just high school, or is it going to actually you know, have the relationships with the parents? And they were really emphatic that it was, um, you know, they wanted to show all of the sort of intersectionality between 
the kids in the school, the parents, the teachers, the community, and how all these issues were affecting everyone deeply. So it wouldn't just be, you know, that the parents were sort of these peripheral characters. And so that that was important to me because I, if I was going to go there, I wanted to make it worthwhile and make it, you know, sure that it was real and in there, and it was. And so it was pretty, you know, pretty remarkable experience. Yeah. So uh, 13 Reasons Why tells the story of Hannah Baker, who sadly takes her own life, and you uh, play her mother. Uh, again, a deep, deep role. How did you kind of prepare for playing um, this part? Because it's very, I get emotional just talking about it, and I'm sure people. Yeah, it's huge. Well, it was obviously, I wanted to be very, uh, it was, you know, I thought about it a lot before I said yes, because I knew I'd have to kind of carry around that energy, if you will, uh, for lack of a better word, of a parent who experiences the unimaginable losing a child to suicide um, for, you know, five or six months. So I um, I did, I talked to, uh, we had a few people consult. There was a doctor, um, Dr. Hugh, who is a, a, is, a, is a psychiatrist at Stanford. I, I t spoke to her and she specializes in um, families that have lost children to suicide and and sort of asked her a lot of questions, um, and then I, a, a couple of parents graciously gave me gave me uh, an hour of their time to talk. Who had lost their son, uh, talked to me about what their experience was, and I could ask that and allowed me to sort of ask questions, specific questions about just for me to um, inform my character and sort of make sure I was kind of going the right direction for me. I wanted to make sure that I was doing honor to them and kind of. Um, as accurately as possible portraying the unimaginable. So that was helpful. But then I didn't want to know too much because it's also, I wanted to kind of do like, you know, I didn't, I didn't read the book. I just read what Ryan, what Brian's adaptation was in the, in the series. That was also important because I wanted to see what his, and we worked together, you know, the writers and I and everybody really, uh, and the, you know, our wonderful costume designer, Carolyn. And uh, yeah, so we all worked pretty tightly. And it's, you know, the show kind of flashes back and forward and, and goes to present time. Uh, how did you kind of balance between, you know, knowing what the outcome is at the end, but then shooting these scenes where you're a strong family unit and you're... I loved that aspect. I actually loved shooting the family stuff, the fun. Like, you're like, hey, we're the happy bakers now. <laughs> or relatively, I was like, when, when do we get to do the happy parts? But I, um, I loved that, and I... I you know, and for the the other thing that I wanted to get really specific about, what he was very specific in the series is that the current time is just about three weeks after Hannah dies, and for over you know maybe a two week period. So that's one of the things that, you know, that's so soon after someone loses a child. So that was partly why it was like I want to get really specific about the look of the character and have her drawn and wearing just pretty much the same stuff all the time and like you know just imagining that what someone would be going through, how difficult it would be to even get out of bed to, to face the world. So to have the contrast of happier times and makeup and hair and wearing colorful clothes. And we also, they designed that show where the current um, present day, all even all the kids were more in subdued colors and grief stricken. And you see the wear and tear of this, how it affects them and the whole community. And then in past tense, everything's a little brighter. So... It was cool. I mean, but it was also, I was lucky because I could go back and forth to L.A. and Northern California where we shot. Yeah. So I could kind of a little bit leave Mrs. Baker up there. And, you know, but I did, whenever I got on the plane from Burbank, <laughs> I'd start getting a little sick to my stomach. Yeah. 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 Deep material. How did you kind of get into the mindset of playing, um, you know, a mom on screen and, and bonding with your on-screen daughter for this? Uh, for the well, it's pretty easy with Catherine. She's such a light and such a joy and so beautiful uh, inside and out and um, such a great actress. And Brian Darcy James is so incredible as is um, Andy Baker. So we really... We just bought immediately. You can't help but love each other. I mean, Brian's so dear and wonderful and... Um, so yeah, it was it was it was pretty easy, and all of the kids are so good. I mean, I'm sure if you've seen it, they're all so talented. Dylan Minnette too. I mean, I we should give him a round of applause. I think he's so good in this. He's Catherine so good. Too. Look so at that little good. face, and he's so sweet too. He's, they're all yeah, just incredible. So how uh, what was the shooting schedule like? How long did the project take? And they started. I think when did we start? Either Jul maybe July, June or July through. Right, I think we wrapped right before Thanksgiving. And um, and they would do two episodes at a time. So they were like, a, one director would take a, a chunk of two episodes. So Tom McCarthy directed um, the pilot in episode two. 
and then um, and then we that that took a little longer, but they would average I don't know about maybe seventeen days for two episodes, which is really tight. For I mean that just to give you an example, and you know when Grey's Anatomy and Private Practice, we would do nine days for an episode, but that's for forty minutes of a show, and this is a full hour, so we jam in two in seventeen days, which is pretty intense. But they that that's a huge you know kudos to the crew and producers and. Um, in, in cast, but really the crew that they were kind of, they had a, a well oiled machine, you know, going and just everyone was in it for the right reasons. Every single person w had a huge amount of respect for this project. Mm -hmm. And what was it like working with Netflix? Um, you know, like you said, you've been on network television. Mm -hmm. Is it different in any way? Um, yeah, it's Paramount. Exciting, we, Paramount was the studio in, Net, in Netflix or the network or whatever. They, it was a co-production, but they were wonderful. They were incredibly uh, supportive, and I think one of the great things about Netflix is you you really creatively, I think, as a, I mean, I can't speak for Brian, but I think they have a lot more creative control, and there's not so many sort of hoops to jump through or cooks in the kitchen, if you will. It's um, It could be a little more of an auteur's uh, medium. So I think it was, they made it very easy for Brian to um, make his vision, you know, and create the show he wanted to create. Yeah. And we're super supportive and passionate about the project as well. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's definitely different because Netflix, like you said, you guys can binge and uh, watch all the episodes. So, you know, it's been about two weeks since the show came out and I feel like a lot more people are watching it. Is it different for you to see the reaction right away versus... Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, it's insane. It's like madness. I mean, it was it, the only thing I can liken it to, it especially to see all the kids, like suddenly they're, you know, all known all over the all over the world instantly. I mean, when Grays got really big, it, it took us, you know... I mean, and that was still a, a huge overnight hit, if you will, but it was took us like nine months to get to. Then we we're like suddenly known all over. But even then, the to get international, it wasn't really possible to kind of have that outreach. And it's kind of incredible that people all over the world got to see it immediately. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we were talking a little bit backstage about how, uh, you know, young people are watching this show and it deals with a certain topic that's um, hard hard to talk about, hard to watch, um, some graphic images of sexual assault and, and suicide are in the show. Um, but you were saying how you think it should be sort of mandatory for schools or for students to I kind do. of There's been it. some, you know, people have been reacting differently to showing um, Hannah um, in the act of, you know, suicide. And uh, all the other, like you say, the sexual assault scenes, rape scenes. Um, but... I th Brian was really, uh, and all of us were, but he really was intent on making sure that there was nothing romantic or mysterious that anybody could project onto this to make it some dreamy, gothy, you know, listening to, <laughs> I don't know, I don't want to throw Morrissey under the bus because I love Morrissey, but you're like, like as if it's some kind of romantic Ophelia moment or that, and I think there's a lot of this idea in the mystery and the shame and the secrecy of suicide that no one talks about it, that you can project this idea that it's all going to be peaceful and blissed out, like peace out, bye, I'm done. And to really deal with depression and mental illness and these huge issues and show it, show what it really looks like if someone tries to take their life. Um, it's, it's ugly and it's really hard and it should be seen and I feel like it should be mandatory in schools that parents and teachers and students watch this and have conversations about, have conversations about sexual assault, about bullying, about LGBTQ issues, about race issues, gender issues, all and suicide and depression and mental health because largely in our country as we see now in in our it's still in this shroud of shame or silence or and uh, and so to really see it for what it is and talk about it and get people help and and in so doing I think prevent it. Yeah. It is important to talk about these issues because like you said it's kind of silence sometimes and people are, you know, some some people are outraged that it shows suicide or rape in the way it does, but this is stuff that happens in real life, and this is stuff high school students and other people are dealing with every day. Absolutely, and that's and it's where it starts, and it's a great place. I mean, you know, so the show takes place. That's why I think the show's been so popular too. Is it's not just a kids show, it's not just a parents show. It's in every I have people that don't have kids that are adults and watching it because it's it's a powerful piece of work. Um, and and it's important, and I think everybody, well, everybody has gone to high school or has been in high school, so I think everybody <laughs> identifies, but even in the world at large, it's just, it's very, um, it's, you know, 
it, it, it's spot on about what's happening right now in our culture. Do you think it's important for parents to maybe watch it um, with oh, their absolutely. Teens? I think they should. I think they should watch it with their kids. I think that it's a great, and that it, I really do think it should be mandatory in schools to, to, to watch this and talk about it and have education around it. I mean, that's what started happening. Unfortunately, a lot of kids' lives were lost before schools started having conversations and having awareness and communities had, started having um, dialogue about it. Um, you know, so long as anything's shrouded in shame and secrecy, nothing good can com come from it. And how is it for you, though, to film, um, you know, cer certain ones of those graphic scenes? Um, was it difficult difficult to kind of get in that mindset and, and, and walk in and film this? You know, it's always difficult, but it's relative. Because if the writing is good and the situation is real and compelling, then it's sort of almost like you become a channel, or you hope you do. And, um, you know, you just want to serve the piece. And so is... is um, you know, I knew that last episode was coming, the whole season. Um, and for those of you who haven't seen it, I don't want to spoil anything for you. But um, I knew that we would be heading to that that moment. And uh, so there's that sort of dread and like, you know, and, and particularly as the longer, you know, that Brian and I got to work with Catherine too. It's just like, oh my gosh. But we luckily we just did we did the actual scene where where I find her in just a few takes, which was which was great. Yeah. And again, our crew is so respectful. I mean, our our a camera operator Tommy has a little, you know a he has a thirteen year old daughter, and every everybody had has some connected. I mean, if you're a human, you're going to be deeply affected by this, whether you have kids or not. You know, yeah. it's one of these shows. I don't think there's going to be. Another season, right? I've heard a little murmuring, but it wouldn't... I don't know what it would touch on. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, we don't know. Because that's what happens when these shows are so successful, especially on Netflix. Uh, people want more and more and more. I know, um, especially when you can binge it all in a day. <laughs> I know. We're all over Netflix because Grey's is still on Netflix and Private Practice and 13 Reasons Why. Do you find yeah. anybody that's rediscovering... Uh, Grays or yeah, it's like a whole new generation. Like kids that are really young. I'm like, wait a minute, you weren't even born when I was doing the show. So how are you fine? Oh yeah, Netflix. Yeah, I know. And I just did another little movie for Netflix, Reality High, a little like kind of John Hughes ish kind of comedy. And then yeah, yeah. So Netflix, it's happening, man. Yeah. Get buy stock in Netflix. Apparently, <laughs> something I don't know. But you were there when Shonda Rhimes kind of came out uh, to the... Now she's everywhere, but yeah. uh, is it weird to look back? Does that feel like a lifetime ago, but Grey's Anatomy is still on the air? So. Yeah, it's crazy. It's amazing. and um, But yeah, it seems like a lifetime ago. It does. Would you ever uh, make an appearance back on the show? People ask me that all the time. <laughs> uh, every day. And I don't know. The answer is like, I kind of, Shonda and I love each other. And we would do, I, I think if she ever asked me to work with her again, or we did something like that, absolutely. You know, but we also feel like we explored Addison, you know, pretty thoroughly between Grey's and private practice. So as much as there's always like that desire, like bring her back or have her come back for this special episode. It's not, you know, I think it, we felt like we, Put it to rest. Yeah. Yeah. I always want more Addison Montgomery. Uh, that's so nice. Thank you. Um, is, is it exciting for you, though, to look back on a show that had, you know, such success, still has success, and it's still on the air? I think it's like 13 seasons in. Oh, it's super exciting. It's crazy. It's like, um, it's amazing. It's such a, uh, a shout out to Shonda and all the writers and actors and, and crew. It's just an amazing accomplishment and, and, and such an anomaly in this culture where you have so much content and so many different things to watch that and choices that the fans just speak, you know, it's, it speaks so highly of the artistry that people are still tuning in and want to see more. So yeah, week after week. I know. It's so different than binge watching. I know. I know. Um, how you know you're in a, a movie this summer? I think Girls Trip. Yeah, yeah. Can you tell Girl us a little trip. bit about that? What a great cast! Too. Girls Trip. I know it's uh, Regina Hall, Queen Latifah, um, Jada Pinkett Smith, Tiffany Haddish, uh, and then I play um, Regina's agent. So it's a, it's a big R-rated body comedy girl trip. It's literally a girl trip, and it is called <laughs> Girl Trip for Universal. And it was really fun. I was actually shooting that at the same time for a while that I was doing 13 Reasons Why. So I was like going back and forth. It was like a total schizophrenic. I was like, okay, I'm going from grieving Mrs. Baker to crazy, uh, I don't even remember my name in the movie, but I, but it was insane. I was on a plane a lot between New Orleans and Northern California. I was, I was, I was flying, I feel like, more than I was acting. Oh but yeah. 
And then getting back and forth into different characters. Oh, yeah. But it was fun. It made it really fun in a way. You're like, it was a nice escape to go and play this other role where I have, like, you know, these this flashy L.A. agent and that's, you know, got these great clothes. And, yeah, it was really fun. Those girls and the women are so great. The movies are so fun. Regina is such a dream. It was really fun. I love that uh, it's a basically an all-women cast. We've seen that a little bit, and now we're getting movies like Ocean's 8. And, yeah, right? Uh, is yeah. that important for you to be surrounded by kick-ass women on the oh, set? Oh, for sure. <laughs> you know, and I kind of got spoiled in Shondaland because she just naturally wrote all these great female roles, and um, she was one of the first people to hire a bunch of uh, female um directors and make sure that like if not most of her writing staff at least like like I would say probably more than half are women so so I was actually shocked when I sort of went out and like oh there's not as many women on this set oh okay this one's a little different but um it's been yeah so I'm always a fan of that more 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 and I'd love to see you know um the pay gap closed because that's just ridiculous and feels a little antiquated yeah, you lots of things. Lots of things need to change. Lots of them. But I see actresses and women in general in every form of work speaking up now because we're talking more about it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where important. it starts. That's where change yeah. starts, having the conversation and the culture. And it just takes one brave executive to say, you know what? Across the board, this is what we're going to do. We're going to pay women exactly what we pay men on our show, and that's how it's going to work. And, you know, that'll... Uh, That'll be a great day. Yep. <laughs> For all of us women. Yeah. Hey, men, yeah. I see you too. But yeah. Uh. Gentlemen, we, we admire you. We love you. We adore you. We just want to get paid as much. Yeah. And, um, did you see there was like a funnier die sketch? Did you see that? Or did anybody see that video around, around um, equal pay? Did anybody see it? It was really funny. Like, what if everything was like everything for guys was you've, if women got two thirds of everything? Like, yeah. if you just got two thirds of a haircut or two thirds of a cup of coffee at every guy's coffee, it was it was really it was a funny thing they did. You should look at search it. It's very funny. Life. Um, oh, life. <laughs> now, before I go to audience Q and A, I do want to know how you go about choosing. Uh, you know, movies or TV or um, is TV where you feel comfortable being or do you like to mix it up? Well, I do. That's why I'm this... Um, I've taken, like, a year off uh, after Bad Judge, and I um, wanted... And I traveled and just rested and did a bunch of stuff, and I really wanted to kind of switch up my career. I mean, I loved doing private practice and Grey's, but it's really intense work to do shows that are 22, 24 episodes a year. And I don't want... I was like, as an artist, it's just not good for me to work that way. Just I don't get the best out of myself. And I feel like it's... I think it's very hard. And it's the hardest job for writers, I think, in Hollywood uh, to write an hour-long show that's on network television. They're like... They get they all get gold stars for me, but I I really like to do shorter commitments things so I could play different characters. Like I loved going to do Fargo and then going to do Bad Judge and then going to do the one of the darkest heaviest pieces I've ever done as you know Thirteen Reasons Why, and then you know this other film Felt, which was a period thing that will come out soon about um, Mark Felt and Watergate. So I like mixing it up. I love I've always loved comedy and drama, and I love all three mediums. You know, each one has a special like a special quality to it. You know, you're doing awesome. It's awesome Thank to see you, you out there. The so show nice. is so Thank good. You. I hope everybody watched it. Um, but let's go to some audience Q and A. Here we go. Hi, Kate. I just want to thank you for being here, and thank you for all the tears that you caused because <laughs> it's this piece was just so important, and it really made me question a lot of things within myself and probably a lot of people. Just experience that I had in high school and then coming to college. And so, thank you. Um, so, my question is Did you have a chance to watch 13 Reasons Why all the way through? How was it for you? What was your experience now being removed from it? <laughs> oh, that's, I haven't watched it all the way through. I um, have seen a few episodes, but I uh, thank you, by the way, <laughs> for the um, nice compliment. Uh, I don't really love watching myself on screen. I um, <laughs> I haven't even watched all my private. I haven't watched all private practice. I just stopped. That's sort of, you know, because I think it's like it's weird. I, I had to when I was doing Bad Judge because I was editing. I was executive producing, so I was in the editing room with them, and I had to look at myself. It was very big. so I had to kind of get over it. But um, I wanted to because it was comedy, and I knew I wanted to sort of make sure things were being cut for timing and everything. Um, but I don't. I don't generally like to watch my stuff after I do it. It's too hard. I think it's too intense and like it's too intense a little bit, but then I'm also 
I think one of the great things about watching, it might be different for this generation and this culture of phones and selfies and where you're used to sort of looking at yourselves and that's part of like living now. But for me, as an, I became an actor because I really, I, I liked performing and having the connection with the audience. I, that's what I love about doing live theater. And similarly, but totally different, I, once I shoot it, like the experience is making it mm -hmm. and having you guys see it and hopefully love it. And so once that happens, I'm like, oh, my job's done. I'm going to go work on something else now. So to go and look at it, I think it's also like if I, you know, you watch a movie so you can, or read a book so you can escape into the story. And I, I find it difficult to escape into myself. <laughs> And be real, you know what I mean? Like the ultimate narcissist, like, look at me now. Look at her. Isn't she wonderful? Ah, uh, Mrs. Baker. What a dream. You know, I mean, and some people don't. Some people don't mind watching their, you know, and I think there's a great thing, too, being able to watch yourself. You can see mistakes and stuff, but then sometimes it just makes you hyper aware of flaws, and you're just like, you know what? It's hard enough for a lady out here. Uh, <laughs> I'd rather watch other people. That's a good question. Who's next? Oh, all the way back there. Hi. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so Dylan Minnette actually guest starred on Grey's Anatomy as a little kid. And there's this meme going around the internet that says um, his character was uh, deaf. He had something wrong with his ears. So there's this meme going around the internet that says Meredith Grey gave Clay Jensen ears so that he could listen to the tapes left by um, Addison Montgomery's daughter. <laughs> oh my god, that's so funny. Oh, the internet. So I was just, I guess you haven't seen it. I was wondering. I've not seen it. If, if you had and what you thought of fans making the connection and if there was anyone else on the show who you had worked with before and built a relationship with. Um, I'm trying to think. I feel like there might be. But I don't remember. I don't. I don't know, because people pop up all over the place. I can't remember quite if they're, I feel like maybe one of the kids was on, I don't know, but I didn't even know that Dylan was. I, I had no idea. How funny. Yeah. It's so crazy. Yeah. So many patients on Grey's Anatomy, though. Can't keep track of them. Oh, I know, but though there was someone somewhere, like on a movie I did, was like, I was on, da, da, da. I'm like, oh my gosh, but yeah. yeah. It is you're a small also, world. It's a small little Hollywood world. Yeah. <laughs> you're also an OBGYN, or so I don't think you'd be working with Dylan Minnette and Grace. No, <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. But is it weird for like the meme culture? Does it kind of throw you? I know. You? I didn't yeah. even. I know. You start feeling so antiquated. You're like, oh yeah, memes too. Gifs, memes. You know, bitmojis. Yeah. Have you? I do have a good bitmoji though. Yeah. <laughs> she has a headband. I wear a head. I wear like a headband. I'm like. Yeah. You're going to have to post and this bitmoji. She put a green, I had her in a green parka when I moved to New York for the winter. I was like, oh, let's put a green. It was kind of fun. It's so, so fun. stupid. I love the internet. It's, I, I know. It's fun. When it's not evil, it's really fun. Yeah. <laughs> and we have time for one more. Here we go. Hey, Kate. Uh, so I know you've been uh, uh, socially and politically involved in some groups like uh, Oceana in the past. Uh, are you, and with Earth Day, Earth Day that just passed, are you uh, still doing anything or still active in any groups? Yeah, I still work with Oceana. Um, and I did post a picture of me on Instagram with a science hat um, that a friend of mine's company makes. Um, uh, which is called, it's Factists, which is a really cool company. You should go online and check out those hats because uh, just, just trying to, you know, keep it real. <laughs> keep the truth going. But I think, um, listen, I think that, uh, look, I'm lucky when I get projects like 13 Reasons Why or even Grays in private practice where we have these beautiful writers that write great gripping stories that are page turners or bingers or whatever you want to call it, but also have great social messages and can, you know, put that in the framework of a story. I feel like that's how we grow and teach each other. And when that's really great entertainment and people like it and critics like it too, then yay, we're all winning. But um, I think this is a really wonderful time in our culture for everyone to get um, politically active or just activate. Even people who, you know, have said, oh, I think that scene, the fact that you show the Hannah... 
uh, the suicide that I didn't like that. I was doing a Facebook Live thing, and I was like, that's great. If you don't like it, go out and do something. Like, the great opportunity about watching art or stories, and if you don't like something or something bothers you, you can get involved and do something about it and, you know, be the change you want to be, as they say, as Gandhi said, and, you know, we all said and said and said. So I think it's um, not just if you're a celebrity or whatever, like, whatever you find important. I'm so amazed by... The younger generation too, and how activated um, people are, and how much they care. I feel like that's. I personally believe that every subsequent generation is a little more conscious and enlightened. And I learn so much from seeing young people involved in their communities and their schools and giving back. And um, no matter who is in office or isn't in office, it's just about you know taking care of each other. And I think that that's one of the great things about Thirteen Reasons Why is it's really the message is we've got to be better to each other. We've got to be better to each other, starting in high school, starting, you know, with every person you encounter on the street, you know? So that's a long answer, no. my friend. That's a great you're answer. I'm sorry, and you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a great message and a note to leave out on. But thank you guys all for being here. Thank you, Kate, for joining us. Thanks and for please watch me. 13 Reasons Why. It's a powerful, yeah. important show. Thanks, guys. Gals.